prayer tonight. We pray, Father, that as we live on this earth, we will always keep you as the priority. We will let your word direct us in our steps, and we will let that same word season our speech, and we will let that word always influence our decisions. We pray, Father, that we will never neglect the opportunities we have, such as right now, just to be able to put life on pause, to open up your word. We pray, Father, that as we are studying tonight, we will be thankful for your word, thankful for its direction. But, Father, we pray that we will be thankful for the hope that's found in your word. We come before you tonight on a number of those that we know that are dealing with different issues and struggling with various things, especially, Father, for Faye Tate. We pray, Father, that as she is in the hospital in Huntsville, as she is having problems with her heart and her kidneys, we pray, Father, that as they look to do a heart cath tomorrow, that all things will go well and they'll be able to do that procedure and get all the things that she's dealing with under control so that she can be home as soon as possible. Pray, Father, also for uh, the family of Willard Carr as we are here tonight. Pray, Father, for Judy. Pray, Father, for all of his family, his brothers and sisters, his children, his grandchildren. And pray, Father, that we will be a part of your comfort as we are a part of a family together. We pray, Father, as we're looking forward to events that take place very soon, we pray, Father, for the revival in America. We pray for two things. Number one, we pray, Father, that we will uh, lend ourselves to being there. But number two, we pray that we will lend our prayers to this event so that others may hear the gospel in a way that will be hopefully very appealing to them. We pray, Father, for the Tennessee Children's Home uh, Food and Supply Drive as we have been participating in that for, for many, many years. We pray, Father, as that home continues to reach out to those that are dealing with situations that many of us will, will never understand because we've never been through them, that they will continue to be able to do work that is good inside of this world and continue to influence others to depend on you and to survive, Father, in this world with you. We pray, Father, that as we think about our lives, we think about our hope that we have, we will always keep it safely inside of you. We will always keep our hearts directed uh, toward you. And we pray, Father, we'll be thankful for all the opportunities that we're given. We pray, Father, tonight that we'll be thankful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are in class number five. We're going to be studying tonight in a question entitled, Where is Heaven? We've got a number of things that we need to do in our class tonight, but before we begin, I want to kind of go back to our class last week and make sure we uh, don't leave any stone unturned there from Luke chapter 16. Go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 16. I want us to see a couple of things. We kind of left with a question last week, and we didn't get to answer it all the way we wanted to, but we will tonight. Luke chapter 16, especially center in on verse 28, because we kind of posed the question as we ended, do people inside or in the other side of this life, in eternity, do they know what's going on here in this life? As we indicated last week, uh, we have no place that directly indicates that those in paradise or those in torments have any indication of what's happening here live as it happens on the earth. A couple of things I want you to point out. If they did, Luke 16, 28 then we know that the man inside of this particular occasion would have known what was going on with his five brothers. He wanted someone to be sent to his brothers, for there are five of them, and he wanted someone to be sent. So if he knew what was going on in this earth with his brothers, um, it would also seem to be indicated there, but it doesn't seem to indicate that to us. Also, you can look at Ecclesiastes 9.5 and 2 Chronicles 34.28, that indicates to us that once we leave this earth, we're no longer involved with the affairs of this life, but we are those who are in either paradise or torments, as we read about in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. So I know that's kind of a short and abbreviated answer, but that's kind of how I'm going to leave that answer. Um, we don't have anything to indicate the, that they do know, but we do have passages that seem to indicate that we will not know what's happening here. But here's what we know. We know what's happening here, don't we? We know what's happening here, and we are all marching toward the same concept, the same idea. We're asking a question tonight, 
in our series, Where is Heaven? And we've got five different areas we want to look at this evening. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of understand some more things about the place that's called heaven. Uh, we know that when we pass from this life, Luke 16, 19 through 31, we spent the whole class in those few verses last week. Uh, we know that when we pass from this life, we go to this realm, and then at the judgment, we will be ushered into that permanent side of eternity. So let's talk about the idea of heaven tonight. Where is it? And here's the main thrust of why we're doing it this way tonight. There is a popular teaching in our world. Um, it is, by the way, let me say this. It's not new. This is not the first time it's come up. Uh, I hate to say this. It won't be the last time it comes up. Uh, teachings that are against Scripture, teachings that are foreign to Scripture, seem to go in this circle cycle. And, and they seem to fade away for a moment, and they seem to kind of pull back in the light. And one of the things that's going on among our brethren, among the world, is the idea that when eternity begins, heaven will be on the earth. So let's ask the question tonight, where is heaven? Here's the five areas we're going to see. Number one, heaven is real. Let, let's indicate to ourselves, number one, that it is a real place. Now, put your seatbelts on because when we hit point number one, we got to go so we can get to point two, three, four, and five. Uh, point two is Jesus comes back. We need to understand something. If heaven is real, number two, Jesus is going to come back. And we'll indicate a number of scriptures to you uh, you will probably, throughout this class, want me to go to John chapter 14. I'm not going to do that in Heaven is Real. I'm not going to do that in the segment entitled Jesus Comes Back. I'm not going to do it in the segment entitled The Earth is Destroyed. The Earth is going to be destroyed at some point in time, but, but we're not going to go to John 14 to that. There are other passages to do that. But we will go to the segment, the fourth segment tonight, Jesus Made a Promise. That's John 14. We'll look at verses 2 through uh, 4 and 5 there in that particular segment and see something that Jesus said to help us indicate some things. And finally, I want to go to a point I've entitled, Eternity is Eternal. Now, I know that's a mouthful. I'm just glad I said it. I'm not going to say it again, so I don't mess it up. But how long is eternity going to be? Eternal. Okay? And we're going to indicate that to ourselves tonight to see some things about this that we need to understand, by the way, as we go through. So number one, let's see the scenes. Heaven is real. Heaven is real. The first thing I want us to indicate to ourselves is heaven is a place. I turn your attention to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. And in this particular occasion, we're reading about the lights that we live, the lives that we live in this particular occasion. It's Jesus who is speaking and he says this, let your light shine before men. Pause with me there. Before you ever think about eternity, where are you living right now? Where are you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on the earth. I wasn't sure who or what could be answered in that moment. But where are you at? Right now, you are on the earth. Right now, listen to me. You are living right now. We are people who are moving and breathing upon this earth. That is normal. That is natural. That's how it always has been. That's how it will be until the Lord returns. And what are we supposed to be doing? Because in our class, we're talking about the other side of life, that is eternity. But we also have to talk about here. If we talk about eternity, we've got to talk about here. What's the number one thing we need to be concerned about here? Uh -huh. Letting our light shine. Brownie said it right. Doing right. So here Jesus begins, it kind of ends this discourse with, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, that's your life, that's your speech, that's your actions, that's the things you do not do. Everything in this life people see. And why should they be able to see this? So that they can glorify your Father. Now listen to this. Which is where? In heaven. Heaven is a real place, number one, because it is the dwelling place place of God. This is not the only passage that shows to us that this is a dwelling place, but heaven is a place. It's where the Father is as well, Matthew 5, 16. It's God's dwelling, Deuteronomy 26, verse 15. In that particular scene, look down from my holy habitation. Look down from the place that you dwell, and it indicates where God dwells. Where does God dwell? Look down from your holy habitation from heaven. Where is the Father? The Father dwells, God dwells in heaven. Now, in this particular scene in Deuteronomy 26, 15, this would be a wonderful prayer for you and I. 
Should we not pray that God looks down from his home, from his habitation, from heaven, and that he blesses us in the land that we dwell? We are very modern, okay? And what I mean by that is we've, we've become dependent on light bulbs, telephones, internet, air conditioning, running water, plumbing, sewer, refrigerators. We've become a very modern people, and sometimes because of all of that, attached to all the other things that we do in this life, we, we kind of misplace where our dependence is. Our dependence is not here. Where is our dependence? It's within God. That's where our dependence is. And that, that's just kind of a side note there. But you can also see God's dwelling in 1 Kings 8, verse, or chapter 8, verse 30, and 2 Corinthians 5, 1, that indicates to us that it is the place that God, God dwells. So there is the idea that heaven is real. So let's just for a moment, I want to do this in one particular point. I want to do it here. What, what's heaven going to be like? Uh, right now, I want us to think about that. Since heaven is real, what do we know about heaven? Well, let me ask you a question before we ever look at this list. And it's not just the, these things on the screen. It's a long list of things. How, how are you and I supposed to know about heaven? Because let me ask you a question, okay? This is yes. This is no, okay? You know anybody that's been there? <laughs> there you go. But do you know anybody today, right now, where you can go and say, pick up your phone, give them a call and say, hey, how is heaven? You know, what do we do? The first thing we do when we go places, we go to web pages, we call someone we know that's been there and we get the information. You and I don't know anyone that's been to heaven and come back. Not in this life. So how do we know about heaven? Scripture, okay? That's, that's the only indication that we can have. Uh, we're going to use some scenes from the book of Revelation to help us understand heaven. Uh, number one, Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, heaven is a city. Now, we're going to talk in just a moment about this city. We're going to see how big this city is. And we're going to use a sheet of 8.5 by 11 piece of paper to determine the, lit, the width, the, the length, the width, and the height of heaven. But we'll just think about that piece of paper, how small that is for just a moment, really how big it is. But we'll see it in just a moment. Heaven is a city. Inside of heaven, it's a place where the light is pure. The light is pure. What, what, does, what does pure light indicate to us? What's the difference between light and darkness? What's the difference in light and dark? What is darkness synonymous with in Scripture? Sin, the devil, terror, problems. What is light connected with inside of Scripture? Salvation, a Savior, the, the idea of eternal bliss. Heaven is a place where light is pure. Heaven is a place that has four walls, Revelation 21, 12 through 14. That's important for us to notice. Why is that important to know? Now listen to the way I'm going to say this. I don't mean it to be rude to anyone. But if you don't belong in heaven, you won't be there. I mean, I, I say that to me too. If you don't belong to he in heaven, you won't be there. Why? Heaven is a fortified city. It has four walls. It has 12 gates, Revelation 21, 12 through 13. It has 12 foundations, Revelation 21, 19 through 20, indicating to us the strength and the security and the preparation of this place. It's a place where the streets are like as unto uh, gold. What's that indicate to us? The grandeur, the, 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 the majesty of the place that John 14, 1 through 6 has been prepared for who? Okay, a prepared people, God's people. So it indicates this idea. The, the, the size of heaven is described. This is Revelation 21, verse 16. It is 12,000 furlongs long, wide and high. Now, a furlong is about 215 yards, which means uh, heaven's length, its width, its height is about 2.58 million yards. Well, let's break that down a little bit more. Uh, that's about 7.7 7 million feet. All right, let's break that down a little bit more uh, to help us understand it. To see how long heaven is, how wide heaven is, and how tall heaven is, you would need 844,363.6 sheets of paper to make the length, the width, and the height. You ever thought about how big heaven is? By the way, let's use this word. It's huge. You ever contemplated that for just a minute? You are the light of the world. Why is it so large? Because God can save. 
Okay, heaven is real based on what we find inside of Scripture. And I wanted us to be able to see this idea of its magnitude to help us to see the concept of heaven being described. What is heaven like? Well, also from Revelation 21, this is specifically from verse 4, it's a place where there's no sorrow. Anybody good with that? Or do we want to sorrow? We don't want sorrow. How about heaven being a place where there's no crying? Everybody okay with that? Anybody good with that? Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Um, I put sorrowing in twice. That's not what, what I intended to do. Now you go read Revelation 21, 4, and you'll find out what else I missed. Uh, there's no pain, Revelation 21, verse 4. That's something that we would love. There's no death. There's no night. There's no sin. There's no curse. Do you not see the idea of heaven? What's the point behind heaven? What's the point behind heaven? You ever thought about that? It's not just that heaven is real. What's the point behind heaven? It's better than we deserve. You ever thought about that? Jesus going to the cross was better than we deserve. But then there's heaven. So what do you know about God? God takes care of his own. So number one tonight, we had to kind of rest through that so we could kind of take our time a little bit. But heaven is a real place based on the information found inside of Scripture. Number two in our class tonight Let's see the fact that Jesus is going to come back. I want you to see something that's true, something you've seen, to give you a little information to help you kind of put it all together in your mind in kind of a biblical sphere to help understand something about Jesus. You know, the Bible is simple, and here's a simple survey about the Bible. From Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to Malachi 3, 18, here's the theme, Jesus is coming. Isn't that true? What's the whole Old Testament about? Christ. That, that's everything that it's about. Matthew uh, 1, verse 1, down to Acts chapter 1, verse 11, Jesus is here. Isn't that true? Did Jesus not arrive in Matthew chapter 1? Matter of fact, in the very beginning of the book of Matthew, you read the genealogy of Jesus and, and how Jesus was born. And, and you read there in that scene, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, and you read what took place there, Jesus is here. Now, in between all of that, at the end of this particular scene, what happens at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What happens to Jesus? Jesus leaves the earth. Number three, in this simple plan, Acts 1, verse 11, down to Revelation 22, verse 21, Jesus will return again. That is the simple plan of what's taking place. And I want you just kind of to think about this because look at what's happening. Genesis 1-1, Malachi 3-18. It's already done. It's already written. It's never going to happen again. That time is over. Matthew 1-1 to Acts 1, verse 11. That time is already written. That time is already done. It's never going to happen again. But what is going to happen? What is going to happen? Jesus is going to come back. Now... We're going to go over this later, later in our class, but when's he coming back? We don't know. So let's see some things about the return of Christ that will help us in this Bible simple overview of what's taking place. Number one, we know that Jesus will return from the clouds. Jesus, when he left the earth, he ascended into the clouds. And it's in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, where men were standing gazing into the clouds and an individual being described here, it was said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. How's Jesus going to return? He, he's not going to return via birth again. That's already been accomplished. How is Jesus going to return? Jesus will return in the clouds. Now we're going to see this theme reinforced in just a moment. Now we're asking the question, where is heaven going to be? Many people say heaven's going to be on the earth, but we're going to illustrate in this point one of the reasons why heaven cannot be here, and it has to do with the clouds. So number one, Jesus is going to return the clouds. Number two, there are things that we do not know. Paul, writing to those in Thessalonica, talks about the times and the seasons, and he says, you have no need that I write about that to you. Why? Now what I love about this is Paul writes and says, for you yourselves know, 
that tells me he's taught about this before. He's talked about this before. He spoke with these people about this before. What's the thing he's talking about? The return of Christ. He says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. All right, show of hands. Anybody had your house broken into or your car? Did they make an appointment? <laughs> they did while you were going. Yeah, yeah, my car's been broken into before. Hey, somebody stole the, the trailer wiring off my truck in the National Airport once. They didn't ask me about that. They didn't make an appointment to borrow that wiring. I've been taking it back and hoping they return it. Why, why do thieves not make appointments? Because <laughs> you don't need to know when they're coming. Now, we don't agree with the thief, but we know why they don't make an appointment, because they don't want you to be aware of what's going on. Why is the Lord not telling us when he's going to return? He wants us to be his. Okay, everything we're talking about with, with eternity, with heaven, is talking about right now. Because you will never make it into eternity if you start in eternity. It starts here. He says, there are some things that you do not know about Jesus who is going to return. Which tells me something. Not everything is meant for me to know. Not everything is meant for me to know. But we move on in the same idea of the teachings inside of, for, well, really we go back in the teachings about this. He'll return for his. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend with heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's coming here to take people to judgment. By the way, I, I don't mean this flipping at all. But God has a plan, correct? Why do we think sometimes we're better than God? Why do we think we know more sometimes? I'm not trying to make accusations at anyone, but sometimes we do that, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves, we do. Whoever thought we knew something better than God, God my way was better how has our way ever worked out? It usually fails, doesn't it? It does. You know, God's got a plan. And God is going to return for his. And I love this idea. He's going to bring his that have already left. He's going to get them first. Inside of Scripture, we have examples. Noah's an example. Matter of fact, in this concept of time, Matthew 24, 36, and 37, but in that day and that hour, knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day, Matthew 24, is he talking about when Christ returns? Matter of fact, anything after the time Christ arrives is talking about the time when Christ is going to return. That's Acts 1, verse 11, all the way down. Remember, they were gazing into heaven. Why are you looking up there? That's how he's going to return. But life continues on. But this is what he says, verse 37. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, when that flood took place, did they know when? What were the instructions that God gave Noah? I want you to build an ark. And if you'll allow me to summarize, here are the specifications. Is that right? I mean, I know I didn't go into detail about the specifications, the length, the width, the height. You're going to pitch, you're going to put a door here, you're going to do these things. Isn't that what he told Noah? Did he tell him when? He didn't, did he? And for some 120-year process in building and presenting to the people that the Lord's going to come, Noah never knew when. But did the Lord come? I want to illustrate a point to you. If God says he's going to do something, what's he going to do? Okay, Jesus is coming back. It's a promise. It's laid out inside of Scripture. And number three, number five, correct me, number five, Jesus means business. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, Paul is writing to these people, evidently. By the way, one of the reasons why we talk about this new heaven, new earth, these, these ideas that are out there, he, even all the way back when 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians was being written, there were problems surrounding the idea of the return of Christ. The idea of heaven being on earth is just a problem surrounding the return of Christ. It's not new. And you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think Jesus is serious? Paul said he was. That obey not what? The gospel. Now the gospel of who? 
Whose gospel is it? It's the only one there is. Now, in a sense, all of you, all of us, we have a teaching, right? In, in some form, yes. But which one matters? Is it yours, mine, or his? That, that's the idea. This is a serious matter in what we're describing in this concept. So number two, number one, heaven is real. Number two, Jesus comes back. Number three, we need to know that the earth is going to be destroyed. Now, we're going to see some passages. As a matter of fact, we're going to see uh, five passages that will help us with this. The earth is going to be destroyed. The first one is 2 Peter 3.10. Now, if heaven's going to be on the earth, why is the earth going to be destroyed? I'll wait on y'all. <laughs> if it's going to, all right, listen. If you invite someone over to dinner, but you didn't tell them the bulldozer was coming five minutes before they got there, how's dinner going to go? <laughs> interesting. Whoever said interesting, that's a good, that's a good explanation to it. Interesting. Listen to 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord, now pause with me there. What day is this? The day of the Lord. Same thing being described in Matthew 24, the time of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the return of who? What's that threefold theme? Jesus is coming, Jesus has come, Jesus will come again. This is the day we're talking about. And guess what? We, we learned something else. Here's Peter. The day of the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night. Well, not going to get an appointment on this. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I want you to notice something, 2 Peter 3.10. Two ways the word heaven is used inside of Scripture. Number one, the heavens. What are the heavens? Sky, universe. That's the heavens, isn't it? Matter of fact, it's described all the way through Scripture as the heavens. That's what we know, the heavens. It's described as the heavenly the heavenly realm in that concept. So number one, it talks about this earth. Number two, how is the word heaven used? The place that, who, it, who is where? Okay, God's dwelling, the place that's heaven. The idea in John 14, 1 through 6, we're going to see it in a minute. Jesus has prepared a place there for us. We've already seen Revelation 21, Revelation 22, heaven. Now I would like to throw this in here. There is kind of a third way the word heaven is used. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is likened unto... What is the likened unto part? That's always describing the church. So, so I want to put that into your mind too as one. But this is talking about this earthly realm, the heavens, the universe, the earth, and all its works will what? Melt with fervent heat. You're both stove eye on? Forgot about it and laid something else on top of the stove eye? Nobody wants to admit that. Somebody in this room's done it. Okay, I got one. There are more than one. I know there's two. I know there's probably more than two. There's two. I got two. All right, fervent heat. Go outside, and that's fervent heat. I'm just, just kidding. Much hotter than that, isn't it? For something to burn up, what must take place? Very large, very, very large amount of heat. When a house fire takes place, is the house standing after all of that heat? No. The firmament, the heavens, the earth, if it's going to go through a fervent heat, if it's going to be verse or the ending of verse 10 burned up, what's going to be left? Nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Very, it, it takes out everything in its path, doesn't it? A very bad volcano. You see, the earth is going to be destroyed. It's how it's going to be. This phrase we need to see. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. This is, the, I told you a minute ago, the idea of Jesus returning to the cloud, Acts 1, 11. This is the counterpart to that passage. In which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Where's the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17? He's not on the earth, but he's in the clouds. Once Jesus ascends, Acts 1, verse 11, those people are staring, gazing. Once Jesus has ascended back, we are never seeing a reference of him anywhere near the earth except 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Because he's going to come and be in the clouds and look at the last part. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
by the way, the earth's going to be burned up. Why would Jesus stay here? But number two, we never see him stepping foot on the earth ever again. The earth will be destroyed. Number three, in this idea the earth is going to be destroyed, Hebrews 8, verse 1 through 4. We don't have time to look at this, but this is verse 1 and verse 4 in the scenes. Jesus is our high priest. But verse 4 says, For if he were on this earth, he should not be a priest. If someone comes to this earth and says he's Jesus and makes himself the high priest, guess who he's not? He's not Jesus. For he would not be and could not be on this earth as a high priest. Jesus has his role. His throne is not here. By the way, where is the throne of Jesus? Want to see it, don't you? There's the idea. It's not here. John, in Revelation 21, could see this idea. Same idea we're going to see in just a moment of the book of Peter. We're going to see in 2 Peter through, and, and later on in Peter. John could see a new location. I saw a new heaven and new earth. This phrase is found twice inside of Scripture. Here's one of the occasions that it is found. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away. The first of what we know. This is very vivid imagery to help us understand the dwelling place we were at is gone. Uh, well, he, I, I believe this is imagery to help us understand a dwelling place. A dwelling place. Heaven is a dwelling place. What's the only dwelling place we know? Earth. You know anybody's dwelled on Mars? You know anybody's dwelled on the moon? That's a trick question. Has anybody ever dwelled on the moon? Very eh, briefly. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. Now, to the Jewish mind, in that period of time, they had a reference to three heavens. Yep. The first heaven being where the birds fly. Yep. The second heaven where the wind and stars and whatever it is. Third. The third heaven was the dwelling place of God. That's right. They talk about, according to that, you would think Paul perhaps got a glimpse into heaven. Yep. Even, even as you read the book of Revelation. And by the way, if you're ever studying the book of Revelation, the key to the book of Revelation is in Revelation 1, verse 1. These things shall come forth shortly. Shortly. But this is a description of this, and that's exactly right. The concept of this is there. So let's see the last thing. Truth is sometimes missed. We get into these discussions about what, where heaven's going to be, all of these things. Don't miss this. In that same connection with the phrase in 2 Peter 3, new heaven, new earth, even Peter used that phrase, Seeing then these things should be dissolved, this earth, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Don't miss that though we're reaching after, we're searching after heaven, it starts here. It starts here. So here's the first things we've seen so far. We finish with the earth is destroyed. So let's see this. Jesus made a promise, John 14. Go with me there. I just want to point out a few things to you to help us understand some things that Jesus said. To help us just see what Jesus said, John 14, read with me verses one or verses 2 through 4. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Okay, Jesus made a promise to do something. Number one, Jesus made a promise about the mansions, the rooms the word mansion does not mean there are many different mansions as we would describe mansions. You know what a mansion is on the earth? Have you ever seen a mansion? you ever seen a house so big you said, that's a mansion? That, that's not the word right here. This is kind of a poorly translated word. This is the word rooms. There is enough room in what? The Father's house. Now that's an important phraseology in the New Testament. Because in whose house should we dwell? The Father's. Number one, he says there's plenty of room. Number two, he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. And this is what he says. I go to prepare a place for you. If heaven's on earth, why did Jesus leave? Okay? But he says, I'm going to go. Prepare a place for you. And if I go, by the way, is he going to go? 
these men that heard this, John 14, saw him go, were a part of the crowd, Acts 1 verse 11, looking into the sky, seeing him go. Then he says this, if I go to prepare a place for you, which has been done, I will what? Come again, now listen to this very carefully, and receive you unto myself. Did Jesus say he'd step foot on this earth again? No, but he did say, I'm going to come and get you. I'm going to come and get you. That where I am, there you may be also. Here's how I know heaven's not on this earth, because Jesus made a promise. I'm going to go, I'm going to come back, and you're going to be with me for the rest of the time. Are those mansions on the earth? Uh -uh. The phraseology cannot be. Matter of fact, the Greek construct, the, the, the construct of the language here, it cannot be in that place. And this is what I want you to see, verse 4. And whether I go, you know... And look at the last part of it. And the way you know. If Jesus promised that there is plenty of room, if Jesus promised to go prepare, if Jesus says, I'm going to come back and we're going to go back, what, what does that mean? I can know the way. The whole idea is where is heaven? Let me tell you, here's the answer to that question. It's where Jesus will be for eternity. Whenever Jesus comes back, you better go with him. Because if you don't, you have missed everything that's taking place. Now, in this idea, it's inside of this particular scene, John 14 and even 2 Peter 3, the book of Hebrews and Hebrews chapter 8, are the main proponents for us understanding that heaven is not on this earth. By the way, I would include Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 in that same list. If there's going to be no sorrows, no crying, no pain, no death, no tears, where can it not be? What's here? Sorrows, death, crying, pain, tears. That's here. By the way, why is that here? See this, why is that here? Why is there sorrow, death, pain, crying, and tears here? Sin, okay? Put the blame where it belongs. Put the blame where it belongs. Let's do that together. When did sin enter this earth? In the Garden of Eden. Why did sin enter this earth? The devil. Temptation. Now, let me ask you a question. You ain't got to raise your hand. You ain't got to answer it. I know Adam and Eve sinned. What about us? Why is there death, pain, sorrows, tears, sin? Because of who? Temptation. That's the what, but the who, that's us. We don't want to admit that, but we need to put the blame where it belongs. So number four, Jesus made a promise. And, and that's that kind of culminating idea of where heaven is. It's where he's going to go back when he picks up his people. That's the idea here. And finally, let's see in the last point, eternity is eternal. I said I wouldn't say that again, but I'm glad I was able to spit it out right. Eternity is eternal. How long is eternity? It's eternal. So let's see this word, kind of see how it was used and make sense of it. The first Old Testament use is in Deuteronomy 33, 27. Matter of fact, it's only used twice in the King James in the Old Testament. The eternal God is thy refuge. What's the idea of that? What is a eternal God? If God is eternal, what does that mean? He, he, he's never ending. Always has been, always will be. That's who God is. And that's the idea of, and I love the part of this, and underneath are the everlasting, he has everlasting arms. What's the idea of that eternal use there? You have the first use in the New Testament. This is in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said to him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit or may have what? Eternal life. The first time it's used in the New Testament, a young, young individual comes to Jesus and says, how do I have eternal life? How long's eternity? How long's eternal life? Never ending, never ending. That's the idea of it never fading away. By the way, life is not eternal, is it? Mm -mm, it's not. Let's see the first use from Jesus. This is Matthew 25, verse 46. It's almost interesting that the first use in the New Testament was someone to Jesus, how can I have eternal life? And the last or the first time Jesus uses it is in Matthew 25, 46. He says, these are going to go into everlasting punishment. Same word is eternal. 
but the righteous into life, what? Never ending. As much as heaven, inside of heaven, eternity is eternal. By the way, Matthew 25, 46, those who go into punishment, by the way, punishment is a really big word to keep you from saying hell. If heaven is eternal, what is punishment? It's eternal. How long is eternal? How long is eternity? Never ending, never ending, never ceasing. Now that's hard for us to understand because how many things never, never, never end here? You bought an appliance recently? Is it eternal? Are you driving your first car? I guess it wasn't eternal. Let me ask you a funny one. Is your hair still on top of your head? Wasn't eternal. You get the idea? It's not here. Eternal is not here. Let's see the concept displayed and then finally see the life of Christ and the class will be yours. Uh, in Jude one twenty one, uh, the idea here is, is living this Christian life, following this Christian life. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What's the concept of eternity? The concept of eternity does not happen in eternity. It starts here. I'm trying to push that in our class tonight. Eternity will never begin in eternity. The eternal realm is beginning here, folks. And I don't mean heaven's going to start here. That's not what I mean. But if you're going to be in heaven, where does that, where does that start? Right here. It's never going to start. You're never going to get to the judgment day and say, I want to be a Christ follower. I want to make my life right. I, I didn't do that right. It's not going to work that way. Those who follow after the love of God and look to him. And finally, the love or life of Christ, the life of Christ. 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you that may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. How long is eternal? How long is eternity? That's why I said I wasn't going to say it too many times, because now I'm asking how long is eternal? Well, it's eternity. There's the idea there. So there's where we've been. There's where we go. We finish uh, next week as we come back. Uh, we will finish in the culminating class of uh, understanding what life is going to be like on the other side of eternity. Thank you so much tonight.